Dr. Uberto Eco, the floor is yours. Good evening. Uh, uh, as probably you know, uh, thank you, Madame the Director. Uh, as probably you know, I have selected this topic uh, for my lecture because I have just uh, edited a book on the history of ugliness after three or four years uh, that we made uh, a history of, of beauty. So since I had some material, visual material, I thought that it was nice to entertain the audience with uh, some funny uh, examples. In every century, uh, philosophers and artists have supplied definitions of beauty, and thanks to their works, it's possible to reconstruct the history of aesthetic ideas over time. But this didn't happen with ugliness. Most of the time, ugliness was defined as the opposite of beauty, but almost no one ever devoted a treatise of any length to ugliness. Uh, the first serious study on that subject was in 1853, The Aesthetics of Ugliness by Karl Rosenkranz. But it was the only consistent example. Hence, uh, while a history of beauty can draw on a wide range of theoretical sources, philosophers, and so on, from which we can deduce the tastes of a given epoch, for the most part, the history of ugliness must seek out its own documents in the visual or verbal portrayals of things or people that were in some way seen as ugly. I must say that to assemble material for a history of ugliness was more funny than to make a history of beauty. Beauty is in some way boring. Even if its concept changes through the ages, nevertheless, a beautiful object must always follow certain rules, so to speak. A beautiful nose shouldn't be longer than that or shorter than, than that. Uh, on the contrary, an ugly nose can be as long as the one of Pinocchio, as big as the trunk of an elephant, or like the beak of an eagle, and so on. Ugliness is unpredictable and offers an infinite range of possibility. Let's say beauty is finite, ugliness is infinite, like God. N nonetheless, um, a history of ugliness uh, shares some common characteristics with the history of beauty. First, for the past centuries, the only documents we have are artworks. Uh, we can only assume that the tastes of ordinary people corresponded in some way with the tastes of the artists of their day, but we are not sure. If a, a visitor from, an alien from the space, outer space, went to a gallery of contemporary art and saw that woman, uh, and, and here are Lucas describing this painting as beautiful, he or she or it might guess the mistaken idea that in everyday life the men of our time find the female creatures with faces like that beautiful and desirable. But our visitor from space might modify his opinion, her opinion, its opinion, on watching a fashion show in which he would uh, witness uh, um, the celebration of other models uh, of beauty. A second, both for beauty and ugliness, we can only speak of the Western culture. For an exotic culture, we usually don't have the theoretical texts to tell us if that, for instance, if that African mask was intended to cause aesthetic delight, holy fear, hilarity, laugh, I, we don't know. Conversely, Believers, believers in some non-European religion might be disgusted by an image of Christ scourged, bleeding, and humiliated, while this apparent corporeal ugliness arouses feeling of sympathy and tenderness in a Christian. In our civilization, we don't find this ugly. So concepts of beauty and ugliness are relative to the various historical periods of various cultures. And to quote Voltaire, Ask a toad what beauty is, true beauty, 
the Tokalom, and we tell you that it consists of his mate, with her two fine round eyes protruding from her small head, her broad, flat throat, her yellow belly and brown back. And ask the devil, he will tell you that the beauty is a pair of horns, four claws and a tail. Attributions of beauty or ugliness are often due to, not to aesthetic, but to socio-political criteria. Marx pointed out how the possession of money may compensate for ugliness. He said, I am ugly, but I can buy myself the most beautiful of women. Hence, I am not ugly. I am lame, but money gives me 24 legs. Now, if we extend this observation on money to power in general, we uh, can understand why many uh, portraits uh, uh, of uh, monarchs, kings of centuries past, were no doubt very, very, very ugly. Huh? But their omnipotence lent them such a charisma and glamour that their subjects saw them through adoring eyes. Let's read, let's read the Friedrich Brown uh, Sentinel, Friedrich Brown's Sentinel, uh, written in the 50s, one of the finest uh, short stories produced by contemporary science fiction. I cannot but cut, but he said, he was soaked to the skin and up to the eyes in mud, and he was hungry and cold and was 50,000 light years far from home. A foreign sun emitted an icy bluish tide, and the gravity, double what he was used to, made the slightest movement worry and painful. The enemy, the only other intelligent race in the galaxy, cruel, repulsive, hideous creatures, horrible monsters. Then he saw one of them creeping towards him, he aimed his weapon and opened fire on it. The enemy gave that strange, horrible cry that all of them used to utter. Then a deathly silence. It was dead. The cry and the sight of the dead body made him shudder. In the course of time, many of them had become accustomed, took no notice of that, but not he. They were horrible disgusting creatures with only two legs, two arms, two eyes, that sickening white skin and without scales. So while reading, we are thinking of something like that. And on the contrary, it was something like that. Uh, Karl Rosenkrantz, in his Aesthetics of Ugliness, draws an analogy between ugliness and moral evil. Just as evil and sin are the opposite of good, whose hell they represent, so is ugliness the hell of beauty. I want only to show you many experiments made by unknown American artists, that artists that I found in internet, suggesting what I say, call uglifications. But uh, ugly is not only the opposite of beauty, because uh, if we examine the synonyms of ugly, we find repellent, horrible, horrendous, disgusting, disagreeable, grotesque, abominable, abominable repulsive, odious, indecent, fool, dirty, obscene, repugnant, frightening, abject, monstrous, horrid, horrifying, unpleasant, terrible, terrifying, frightful, nightmarish, revolting, sickening, fetid, fearsome, ignoble, ungainly, displeasing, pleasing, tiresome, offensive, deformed, disfigured, and so on. So there is a, a variety, a very rich of phenomenology. In general, it seems that the experience of beauty arouses what Kant uh, defined as a disinterested pleasure, whereas we would like to have all that seems agreeable to us and to take pa part in all that seems good. The judgment of taste as the sight of a flower, procures a pleasure that excludes any desire for possession 
or consumption. We don't, you don't want to eat the, the, the flower. We want to, to watch it. Here, certain philosophers have wondered whether it is possible to make an aesthetic judgment of ugliness, given that ugliness arouses emotional reactions such as disgust and repulsion. As a matter of fact, we ought to distinguish between manifestation of ugliness in itself, like the, the ugliness of an excrement, uh, decomposing carrion, someone covered with sores who gives us of a nauseating stench, uh, or this animal, which uh, last year won the contest for the ugliest dog in the world, and, and we have to distinguish it uh, this sort of natural uh, total ugliness from formal ugliness, understood as a lack of equilibrium in the organic relationship between the parts of a whole. Besides, this beautiful painting by Ghirlandaio suggested, as the tender attitude of the grandchild shows, that a person, an animal, or else can be ugly and at the same time, nice and lovable, as it happens to us with many actors. They are ugly, but we like them. However, this portrait is also an example of beautiful artistic representation of ugliness, which is another kind of concept, because there is also the artistic ugliness. Let's see on the contrary. Uh, this example of ugly artistic uh, representation, a real example of kitsch. Incidentally, the author was Adolf Hitler. And the fact that he decided later to shift to politics has been certainly a disaster for the history of the world, but a happy event for the history of art. <laughs> the, the Greek identified the beautiful with the good, kalos kai agathos, and by consequence, the ugly with the evil. See, for instance, the description of Thersites in Homer. Thersites was the ugliest man that stood before Ilium, bandy legs and lame in one foot. He had the round shoulders hunched over his chest. He had the pointed head and sparse thin hair. Achilles and Ulysses hate him the most, for he often insulted them. But at the same time, the Greek know that Socrates was as ugly as uh, Silenus, but he had a great soul. And uh, Aesop, who, according to the legend, was repugnant to the sight, disgusting, fat belly, bulging head, pug nose, gibbous, swathed and short, with flat feet, short arms, bandy legs, thick lips, stammered, and was quite unable to express himself, was defined as a, a benefactor of humanity. We idealized the Greek culture uh, and mainly focused around beauty and harmony. We idealized the Greek culture as a culture mainly focused about, uh, around beauty and harmony, but we frequently forget that the Greek world was also populated by terrifying creatures, hybrids, that violate the laws of natural forms, like the harpies or the sirens, who, were not attractive women with the tail of a fish as described and represented by the later tradition, but nasty, rapacious birds. And there was Priapus, who was considered ridiculous because of that huge member that was not thought to be handsome and was defined as amorphous, without form, I, ugly, ice crown, because he was not, he had, the correct form. He was oppressed by loneliness and his incapacity to seduce a nymph dependent of his hypertrophic possibilities. Even, through the hist even though the history of literature is full of descriptions of ugly men, there is a, another interesting aspect of ugliness which is the vituperatio with regard to women 
whose ugliness reveals the inner malice and pernicious powers of seduction. And that was a team that enjoyed a great success. So it happened so in the classical literature and Horace, Catullus, and Marshall had already provided us with the repulsive portraits of women. And uh, in the early Christian literature, the problem of cosmetics cropped up with Tertullian, who remarks with ruthless severity that according to the scriptures, the allurement of beauty are always as one with the prostitution of the body. And apart from moral condemnation, Tertullian is insinuating that women plaster themselves with makeup and other artifices to conceal their physical defects. In the Middle Ages, there were many portrayals of the old woman, a symbol of physical and moral decay, and the acme of misogyny was reached in Boccaccio's Corbaccio. The, nar the narrator loves unrequited a beautiful widow, and his evident resentment is expressed by the soul of her husband that ascends for, from purgatory to tell the narrator about the licentiousness and the per perfidy of this woman, revealing that she conceals her 50 years with creams and other revolting muck and dwelling at length upon the disgusting details of her physical ugliness. During, that's Leonardo, the Renaissance, female ugliness became the subject of lampoons containing ironic praise of models that didn't conform to the dominant aesthetic canons. And let me only quote, uh, in translation, obviously, these nice verses of Clément Marot on two ugly teeth. Teeth that is nothing but skin, scrawny, flag, limply flapping, big teeth, long teeth, squashed teeth, teeth like a bun, teeth with a pointy nipple, like the sharp end of a funnel. You jounce about at every move without any need for a shake, toast, a tilt, Teeth, hanging teeth, wrinkled teeth, teeth that gives mud instead of milk. The devil wants you in his infernal family to nurse his daughter. Teeth to be thrown over one's shoulders, and so on and so forth. Later, later in the Baroque period, a woman's imperfection was described, described as an element of interest, sometimes of a sensual stimuli. Poems appeared in praise of women who stammered or were dwarfs, hunchback, cross-eyed, pockmarked, and in contrast to the medieval tradition of highly colored or rosy cheeks, Marino stole the pallor of his beloved. And I, want, I want to Giovanni Battista Marino to read it first in Italian because I find it very beautiful. Pallidetto mio sole, ai tuoi dolci pallori, Perde l'alba vermiglia i suoi colori. Pallidetta mia morte, alle tue dolci e pallide viole, la porpora amorosa perde vinta la rosa. Oh, piaccia la mia sorte, che dolce teco impallidisca anch'io, pallidetto amor mio. Oh, one little son of mine, the bright red dawn loses its colors before your sweet pallor. Oh, dear pallid death of mine, vanquish the rose loses its red, amorous color before your sweet and pallid violets. Oh, let it please destiny that I might become as pallid as you, my sweet love. But probably the most grotesque celebration of the female ugliness is to be found in the Anatomy, anatomy of Melancholy by Robert Burton. Love is blind, as the saying is, cop cupid's blind, and so are all his followers. Quis quis amat ranam, ranam putat esse dianam. Every lover admires his mistress, though she be very deformed of herself, ill-favored, wrinkled, pimple, pale, red, yellow, tanned, tallow, 
tallow face, have a swollen juggler splatter face, or a thingling chitty face, have clouds in her face, be crooked, dry, bold, goggle eyed, blear eyed, or with staring eyes, she looks like a squid's cat. Hollow eyed, black or yellow body eyes, or squint eyed, sparrow mouthed, Persian hook nosed, have a sharp fox nose, a red nose, China flat great nose, a nose like a promontory, rotten teeth, black and even brown feet, a beetle brown, a witch's beard, her breath stink all over the room, her nose drop winter and summer with a Bavarian poke under her chin, a sharp chin, lave eared with a long crane's neck. Her dogs like to double jack, so as no dogs in that other extreme bloody fallen fingers. She have filthy long unpaired nails, scabbed hands or wrist, a tan skin, a rotten carcass, crooked back. She stoops, is lame, splay footed, as lender in the middle as a cow in the waist, gouty legs, her ankles hang over her shoes, her feet stink. She breed lies, a mere changeling, a very monster, a slot, a scold, a nasty, rank, filthy, beastly queen, dishonest, peradventure, obscene, base, beggarly, rude, foolish, unthought, peevish. If he loves her once, he admires her for all this. He takes no notice of any such errors or imperfection of body or mind. He had rather have her than any woman in the world. As for male ugliness, we have already seen in the past uh, era, uh, Priapus, but Hegel pointed out in his aesthetics uh, that uh, it started with the Christian art when it had to represent uh, the passion of Christ. Since uh, Christ, for, for, for representing Christ, uh, from Mantegna to Mel Gibson. Art could not use the form of Greek beauty to portray Christ scourged, crowned with thorns, dying on the cross. But at the same time, ugly was uh, Christ, but uh, uh, ugliness was also the typical future of the persecutors of Christ, of the enemies. And since in the Christian world, sanctity is no other that imitation of Christ. Uh, atrocious, atrocious suffering was the lot of martyrs and of saints appearing in all the splendor of their bodies made ugly by penitence. If saints had to be ugly but lovable, for the Middle Ages, even monsters were not always terrifying beings like the ones of the apocalypse uh, or the dragoon uh, and so on. There were amiable monsters who populated the bestiaries and the books of mirabilia, gentle creatures whose form and habits were certainly extraordinary and equally far removed from every human ideal of beauty or fitness, but who were considered as bearers of symbolical and moral meanings. Such were, for instance, the panotti with enormous ear, the cynocephaly, the seapods in the, in the middle creatures uh, with a single leg on which they run very fast indeed and which they hold upright when they sleep in order to enjoy the shade cast by the single enormous uh, foot. Or you see the monocles, the right and the and the at the left the blemier who had the the no head and everything on the on the chest not not to speak of, of the most beautiful among the monsters the unicorn which could be captured only by leaving a virgin beneath a tree so that the animal attracted by the odor of virginity would go and lay its head on her lap and in this sense, it was a symbol for chastity and so on. Monsters didn't disappear with the medieval mirabilia, but returned in the modern world, albeit in another form, as portents. Portents were 
amazing uh, and prodigious but natural events, like the birth of hermaphroditic two-headed babies, strange uh, animals, uh, uh, and so on and so forth. And the attitude toward these creatures was no longer fright or an attempt to decipher their mystical significance, but of scientific curiosity, of at least of pre-scientific curiosity. An important chapter in any history of ugliness was the physiognomy, a pseudo-science which, in De La Porta and other authors, associate facial features and the form of other organs with characters and moral dispositions. So in the human physiognomy, De La Porta compares the faces of various animals with human faces, starting from the philosophical persuasions that the divine power manifested its regulating wisdom even in physical uh, features. Uh, following the scientific growth of these researches from La Fater to the 19th century phrenology, we arrive to the criminal anthropology of Cesare Lombroso, who by studying the traits of criminal personality didn't simplify things to the point of saying that ugly people are always criminals, but he did associate physical stigmata with moral uh, stigmata and analyzed the, the, the head, the form of a prostitute, of, of a murderer, and so on and so forth. The identification between ugliness and wickedness, in fact, appears a every time it was useful to represent uh, the enemy. Like, for instance, the Pope on the part of the Protestants, or the, the, the Saracen of the proletarian. But it reached its peak in the racist uh, representation of the features of the Jew. Uh, let me only quote a passage for the infamous fascist journal La Difesa della Razza, entitled How to Recognize a Jew. What are the, car and this is a representation during the Republica of Salo, of the typical Jew who was at the same time American, you see, but having a, a red cross, he was at the same time Soviet Union linked. So it was the quintessence of uh, wickedness. And um, the text says how to recognize a Jew. What are the characteristics of a Jewish type? A strongly hooked nose, different according to the individual, often with a prominent nasal septum and marked flaring nostrils. Certain individuals from Southern and Eastern Europe have a vulturine profile so pronounced as to make one think of a selected type. Fleshy lips, the lower one often protuberant, sometimes very noticeably. Eyes not deep set in the sockets, with usually a gaze that is rather moister and clamier than that of other types, and more hooked eyelids, woolly hair, and regarding to the body, slightly curved shoulders and flat feet, not to mention rapacious gesture and the slouching gait. However, between the end of the 18th century and the flowering of Romanticism, we witness a sort of redemption of ugliness. It happened first with the aesthetics of the sublime, which imposed a radical change in the way people saw the ugly by analyzing our reaction to natural phenomena dominated by the formless, the painful, and the terrifying. Thus, we sense the sublime on seeing a storm, a rough sea, rugged cliffs, glaciers, abysses, uh, bounded stretches of land, caves and waterfalls when we can appreciate emptiness, darkness, solitude, silence, and the storm. All impressions that can prove delightful when we feel horror for something that cannot possess us and cannot harm us. On his essay on tragic art, Schiller, observe that it is a general phenomenon of our nature that sad, terrible, even horrific things are irresistibly attractive to us, and that scenes of suffering and terror repel and attract us with equal power. 
and that we greedily devour ghost stories that make our hair stand on end. It was the spirit that led a few, a few decades previously to the Gothic novel, which with its ruined castles and monasteries, terrifying walls, bloody crimes, diabolical apparitions, and decomposed bodies. Thus, among the protagonists of the romantic drama, we see the damned hero, like in Byron, or the villains uh, to be found in Sue, Balzac, uh, Emily Bronte, Stevenson. But the most ardent romantic eulogy of ugliness came with Victor Hugo's preface to his play Cromwell. The ugliness that Hugo saw as typical of the new aesthetics was the grotesque, a deformed, horrible, repellent thing transported with truth and poetry to the realm of art. And the grotesque was the most fecund of the sources that nature makes available to artistic creation. As Raymond Baudet observed, Hugo makes beauty turn a full circle, circle, thus leading it to coincide with ugliness. See, for instance, the description of Quasimodo, the hunchback of Notre Dame, we shall not give to the reader an idea of that teeth riddle nose, that horse shoe mouth, that little left eye obstructed with the red bristling eyebrow, with the right eye disappearing entirely beneath an enormous wart of those teeth in disarray broken here and there, like the battle parapet of a fortress, of that callous leap upon which one of these teeth encroached, like the tusk of an elephant, of that forked chin, and above all of the expression spread over the whole, of that mixture of malice, amazement, and silence sadness, and so on, and so on, and so forth. And there is the description of l'homme qui rit, the man who laughs, will plain. Nature has been prodigal of her kindness to Gwynplaine. She had bestowed on him a mouth opening to his ears, ears holding over to his eyes, a shapeless nose to support the spectacles of the grimace maker, and a face that no one could look up without laughing. But was it nature? Had she not been assisted? Two slits for eyes, a hiatus for mouth, a snub protuberance with two holes for nostrils, nostrils, a flattened face, all having for the result an appearance of laughter. It is certain that nature never produces such perfection single-handed. But is laughter a synonym of joy? Such a face could never have been created by chance. It must have resulted from intention. Had Gwynplaine, when a child, been so worthy of attention that his face had been subjected to transmutation? Why not? Industrious manipulators of children had worked upon his face. It seemed evident that a mysterious and probably occult science which was to surgery what alchemy was to chemistry, as chiseled that flesh, evident at a very tender age, and manufactured its countenance with premeditation. That science, clever with the knife, skilled in, obtru in obtrusions and ligatures, had enlarged the mouth, cut away the lips, let bare the gums, distended the ears, cut the cartilages, displaced the eyelids and the cheeks, enlarged the zygomatic muscle, pressed the scar and cicatrice to a level, turned back the skin over the lesion whilst the face was thus stretched, from all which resulted that powerful and profound piece of sculpture, the mask. Gwynplaine. The search for the interesting or the grotesque also leads us to the image, to imagine the deformity that drags toward the tragic destiny. Those who may be meek by nature are condemned by their own bodies. Like the first unhappy ugly man of romanticism, 
the monster in Frankenstein, or the heroes of Verdi's melodramas like Rigoletto, or Cyrano de Bergerac, as well as the women condemned to an everlasting unhappiness by their unpleasant countenance. There is a short story by Zola, Le Repoussoir. A certain Durando realized then that on seeing two women walking together, and when one of them is visibly ugly, then by contrast, everyone finds the other one pretty. So he decides to make ugliness a business and sets up an agency where ladies can hire an ugly female partner to stroll along at their side and thus highlight their own good looks. Even though sometimes the client is even uglier than whatever companion is offered to her, and then she discovers her own scarce attractiveness only in that moment. It's awful to read about the recruitment process and the way in which ugly women are told about the reasons and the purpose for their being hired. But what is even worse is the suffering of the chosen candidates who, after enjoying a day, spend dressed elegantly at the theater or an expensive restaurant in the company of a high society lady must return to their lonely lodging of an evening faced with a mirror that reminds them of the atrocious truth. And it is the same mirror which is quoted by the young Sartre in which he discovered his own condition of an irremediably unattractive man and an ugly duckling beyond the redemption. They are terrible pages. Decadentism was especially indulgent even with the most repugnant forms of physical decomposition, the poems by Baudelaire on La Charogne. And from the 19th century on was the corruption caused by lung disease is sublimated not only by literature but also by painting whether the artists make idealized portrayals of the exhausted abandon of beauty on the verge of death. Let me quote only a short passage from Barbet de Reville. Yes, by Leah, you are beautiful. You are the most beautiful of creatures. I wouldn't give you up your defeated eyes, your pallor, your sick body. I would not give them for the beauty of the angels in the heavens. In the heavens, that dying woman burned him like the most ardent of women. In the beginning of the 20th century, the futurists fought against moonlight, museum, and libraries, and set themselves the task of boldly producing ugliness. And uh, Palazzeschi, in uh, Incontro Dolore, called for the younger generations to receive an education in the disgusting. We have to teach our children to laugh, to laugh the most unrestrained, insolent laughter. We will supply them with educational toys, hump-baked, hump blind, gangrenous, crippled, consumpting, syphilitic puppets that mechanical cry, shout, complain, are afflicted with epilepsy, plague, cholera, hemorrhoids, the clap, insanity, puppets that faint amid the death rattle and die. Their teacher will suffer from dropsy and elephantiasis or be thin as a rail, long-limbed with a peck like a giraffe. One tiny little teacher, a stunted hunchback, and another gigantic teacher with a prepubescent face, an extremely feeble voice who weeps tears, tears like shards of glass. We futurists want to cure the Latin races, especially our own, of conscious pain, conformist syphilis, aggravated by the chronic romanticism, and of the monstrous susceptibility and piteous sentimentalism that depress every Italian. 
We want to substitute the use of perfumes with the use of stench, transforming insane asylums into finishing school for our new generations. Buccioni called the sculpture, uh, 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 also that painting, anti-grazioso, anti-pretty. Then German expression is portrayed with systematic and ruthless insistence, haggard and repugnant faces that express the squalor, the corruption, the smug carnality of the bourgeois world that was to become the most uh, docile supporter of the dictatorship in the Dada movement, the attraction of ugliness emerged through an appeal to grotesque, a propensity for disturbing situations and monstrous images is evident in the Surrealist Manifesto of 1924 and uh, in films like Buñuel and Chien Andalou, where we see repugnant operations like the vivisection of an eye. But I immortalize the big toe and flowers as objects of disgust. Later, the informal movement was to reassess what had until then been seen as unrepresentable. In other words, the more inaccessible depths of matter, molds, dust, and mud. New realism rediscovered the detritus of the industrial world and fragment of destroyed objects. Exponents of pop art like Warhol appealed for an aesthetic, of recy an aesthetic recycling of waste and Piero Manzoni presented in a gallery and sold at a very high price, artist she, Merda d'Artista. Today, we recognize as artistically beautiful all those works that had horrified our fathers. The ugliness of the avant-garde has been accepted as a new model for beauty and has given rise to a new commercial circuit. Certainly, in contemporary art, the borderline between beautiful and ugly has been cancelled. Better, contemporary art doesn't seem still interested in producing beautiful objects, but rather in producing forms of provocative behavior. But it has been said that the borderline between beautiful and ugly has by now disappeared also in our everyday life. We today coexist with contrasting models because the opposition beautiful ugly has no longer any aesthetic value. Ugly and beautiful would be two possible options to be experienced neutrally. It seems so if we consider that monster can be ugly in many science fiction movies uh, or in the various nights of the living dead, but the others are certainly lovable, or like E.T. or the extraterrestrials of Star Wars, and fascinate not only children who are also fond of dinosaurs, Pokemon, and other deformed creatures, but also adults who, who relax in front of splatter movies where brains are reduced to pulp and blood spurts onto the walls, or amuse the, themselves by reading horror stories. But the same person do not seem to have lost the traditional sense of beauty, since they still take aesthetic pleasure in a fine landscape, a handsome child, or a flat screen that shows the canons of the golden section, the same people today accept the ideas of furnishing design teams, of hotel architecture, and of entire tourist industry which sells classically pleasing forms. See the Las Vegas versions of Venetian palazzi, ancient Roman dining rooms, or Moorish architecture. And at the same time, choose restaurant or hotel, ennobled by 20th century avant-garde paintings, genuine or reproduction, that they grandparents would have considered the negation of the ideals of classical antiquity. The cinema, television, and magazine, advertising and fashion all propose models of beauty that are not different from the ancient ones. And we could easily imagine the face of Richard Gere, of Nicole Kidman, 
portrayed by a Renaissance painter. But uh, at the same time, people who identify with these aesthetic or sexual ideals also go into raptures over rock singers whose feature would have struck Renaissance men as repellent. And the same youngster often made themselves up, uh, tattoo themselves up, they tattoo themselves and they pierce their flesh with pinks so they look more like Marilyn Monson than like Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> See a comparison between a contemporary example of piercing and two faces painted by Hieronymus Bosch. Uh, but Bosch wanted to portray the enemies of Christ. Uh, and so he painted the, them as people of his days conceived as barbarians or pirates. And let's, let us not forget that uh, as late as the 19th century, psychiatrists saw tattoos as a sign of degeneracy. Today, piercing and tattoos are thought to be a generational challenge at most, but they are certainly not seen by the majority as a criminal choice. And the girl with a tongue stud or a tattoo dragoon on her exposed belly can take part in a march for peace or for starving children in Africa. Neither the young nor the old seem to find the, this contradiction a dramatic one. The late 19th century esthete who favored cadaverous beauty as a challenge to or a rejection of the taste of the majority knew that he was cultivating what Baudelaire called le fleur du mal, the flowers of evil. But uh, such people chose the horrible precisely because they had decided to make a choice that sent them above the crowds of right-minded people. They, they want to be normal. But young people who flaunt an illustrated epidermis or spiky, spiky blue hair do so that to feel similar to the others. Why their parents to go to the cinema to enjoy scenes previously only visible in the anatomy theaters do so because uh, così fan tutti. Another case in which we come up against the dissolution of the opposition, ugly beautiful, is the cyborg philosophy. At first, the image of a human being whose various organs have been replaced with mechanical or electronic apparatuses, the result of a symbiosis between man and machine, could still represent a science fiction nightmare. But with the advent of cyberpunk, the prophecy has come true. What's more, radical feminists like Donna Haraway are proposing to overcome gender difference through the creation of a neuter, post-organic, a transhuman body. Does this mean that the clear distinction between beautiful and ugly has really disappeared? Why, if uh, certain behavior on the part of young people or artists were only marginal phenomena practiced by a minority with respect to the world population? And what if cyborgs, splatter, and the living dead were superficial manifestations played up by the mass media through which we exercise a far more profound ugliness that says and appalls us, something we would wish to ignore. In every day, day life, we are surrounded by horrifying sights. We see images of children dying of hunger, reduced to skeletons with swollen bellies. We see countries where women are raped and by invading troops, and other where people are tortured just as we are continually exposed to images from the not too distant past of other living skeletons doomed to the gas chambers. 
we see bodies torn apart by the explosion of a skyscraper or an airplane in flight. And we live in terror that tomorrow it may be our turn. We all know perfectly, perfectly well that such things are ugly. Not only in the moral, but in the physical sense. And we know this because they arouse our disgust, fear, and repulsion, independently of the fact that they can also arouse our compassion, indignation, instinct of rebellion or solidarity. Even if we accept them with the fatalism of those who believe that life is no other than a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury. No knowledge of the relativity of aesthetic values can eliminate the fact that in such cases we unhesitatingly recognize ugliness and we cannot transform it into an object of pleasure. So we can understand why art in various centuries insistently portrayed ugliness. Marginal as the voice of art may be, it attempted to remind us that uh, despite the optimism of certain metaphysicians, there is something implacably and sadly malignant about this world. My book concludes with a text by Italo Calvino, a short story, La giornata di uno scrutatore, that uh, springs from real experience. The Cotolengo, in Turing is a Catholic institution full of incurably ill people, persons who cannot even feed themselves without assistance, many of them born as monster, like many of those we have talked about and you have seen here. Not legendary monsters, but monsters who live ignored alongside us. The main character of the story is a scrutatore, a man sent by a political party to control the elections. Uh, the election, because uh, there is a polling station even in that hospital, because those monsters are as citizens too, and according to the law, they have the right to vote. Shocked by the sight of this subhumanity, the scrutator realizes that very many of the patients do not realize what they are going to do and that they will vote according to the will of their religious helpers. Belonging as he does to a leftist party would like to oppose what strikes him as a fraud. But in the end, against all his political convictions, he concludes that those who have the courage to devote their life to those unfortunates have acquired the right to speak for them. I would like to conclude even my speech in the same vein. I have presented images that obliged us to recognize that ugliness can provoke either fear and disgust or amusement, making us to, to laugh on many human miseries. But after having bit, witnessed how pleasant ugliness can be when it doesn't concern ourselves, I think it's wise to end with an appeal for compassion. Thank you. So thank you very much. That was really nice indeed. <laughs> much better this than the last slide. Anyway, uh, we are now ready for discussion. Mama, what do you want to ask? What do you want to ask? But come here with the microphone, otherwise I miss uh, half of the words. Uh, if not important, because I have prepared the answer, so I can answer. 
You are not that lucky. <laughs> I have the first one. Prosim, no, Ivan, ti si. <laughs> ja, prosim. Heavy the microphones, don't, please. Don't, don't hear. Huh? You, you need the microphone. Rudy Riesman. Uh, Professor Eko, you again proved that... Uh, take your microphone, please. Closer. Yeah. Close to your mouth. You again mm -hmm. proved the power of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary analysis and interpretation of the chosen topic. So I take the privilege to ask you whether you would encourage the aesthetical interpretation of ugliness and beautiful on other spheres of social work. I'm here referring and having in mind especially to use this kind of analytical differentiation to the fields of the history of ideas. Can we speak also about ugly and beautiful ideas, ugly and beautiful ideologies, ugly and beautiful politics, if there is anything like beautiful politics at all. If this question makes any sense, I would be grateful for your brief comment. Thank you. I hate metaphors, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> except, uh, except in poetry, except in poetry. So it's uh, usual and normal we speak of um, beautiful moral behavior, beautiful idea, but it's a metaphor. It's a metaphor. Except we speak of the beauty and of the elegance of a mathematical demonstration of a silo. In that case, we are really aesthetically speaking of a, of a balance of a proportion. But to say you had a beautiful uh, idea is like to say uh, we made a beautiful love yesterday and I want to have then a beautiful scotch to, to finish the experience. <laughs> Prosim, Ivan, ti, ja, tukaj prosim. Mogoče bi imeli pa kaj več mikrofonov, pa bi šlo lažje. My name is Ivan Svetlik and I must say, Dr. Eka, I enjoyed your talk very much. But it seems to me that from the beginning where it was funny, it turned to a very serious conclusion at the end. Uh, what uh, uh, I was my, thinking... My friend Rudy took it too far from your mouth and you are sorry. to be, take it too close to your mouth. Sorry. Make a, a beautiful average uh, solution. <laughs> sorry. What, is it okay now? Uh, sorry. Uh, I wanted to say that I enjoyed your talk very much, but it seemed to me that it turned for a, from a rather funny beginning to a very serious conclusion, uh, by which I mean that uh, this uh, disappearing uh, distinction between beauty and ugliness uh, makes us thinking about uh, what, where we are going to. And I would like to ask you, could you link or interpret this disappearing uh, difference from the perspective of raising individualism in this society? Because individualism has become so high a value that everybody has the right to be different. And therefore, perhaps, uh, there is a natural conclusion that uh, ugliness has become very much acceptable. I quote this idea that the distinction beauty ugliness is disappearing as an idea which has been put forth and there are many essays on this subject. But I think it concerns only uh, contemporary art. Because in the rest of our life, think of designs, design, the form of a car, of a TV set, uh, of, a, of dishes, uh, we are still following notions of, of beauty, which are the classical ones. Huh? 
we want a beautiful car, very well designed, with uh, harmonious uh, shapes. Uh, so, so we have still uh, an idea, a pretty, a pretty traditional idea of, of beauty in the, 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 in the form of a tie and a jacket. Uh, so is it in contemporary art that the, the distinction has been cancelled? Because, I repeat, art is no more interested in, in beauty, but in something else. That these can express a form of individualism and the decision to be original at any cost, that's true. That's true, and that's probably the reason why many aspects of contemporary art are divorced from, from the society in which they live. They, they, they are still alive only in the circuit of art galleries and few collectors. That's, and, and they don't, do not realize that, uh, on the contrary, people is watching cinema, television, where you can have the triumph of another form of ugliness to which a chapter of my book is the style I have not, uh, which is kitsch, the fake uh, beauty. The, but that's another story as Kipling would have said. Thank you very much. Is there any question? Yeah, let's go. Let him go. Please, as an Italian and an expert on beauty and ugliness, what do you think about Darfur, which is very close to us now, just across the Mediterranean Sea and the desert? But uh, I have spoken about Darfur when I said that, that we are continually, continuously confronted by newspaper or TV with real ugliness. Uh, and I was just uh, thinking of those uh, tragedy of the present world in which you, you, we recognize that that is ugly, that is ugly. So it's untrue that I was making a polemics against uh, the, the philosophical idea that uh, the distinction beauty ugly has disappeared. No, we are still sensitive to the real, profound, deep ugliness of everyday life. To the mass graves, to the rape woman, to the burned children. That's why I have said, you are summarizing very well my thought, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Some more questions. <laughs> yeah? I don't want to give a bad example. I quit smoking. I don't smoke any longer. I eat it, as a, which makes a difference. <laughs> um, Maya Bogatai, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. At the beginning, you said it yourself, um, the be beauty is boring. I think you used the words of Picasso when he was asked why he is doing these ugly, in quotes, paintings. But, and I think that the marketing today is using ugliness because it is shocking and because beauty is boring. So. The values that we are introduced by heavy marketing, do you think that this machine is also selling the popularity of concept of ugliness? Thank you very much. No, if, I, uh, if I have caught well your intervention, you are saying that even uh, the editorial success of the history of ugliness is uh, the proof that people prefer be uh, ugliness. But I quoted Schiller, he said, people like horrible stories because they are less boring that, you know, even this world were not crime, adultery, narrative couldn't exist. You cannot, you cannot tell the story of a man living in the woods and being happy. That's legit. Yes, once um, the German one, um, the major, the major in, uh, well, but uh, they, they are boring. So we are excited by, by, by ugliness. That's, uh, there is no, no doubt. 
to start from the, the Romans then went to the Colosseum to see the Christians eaten by the lions. If you read the, the journal of Samuel Pepys, uh, he paid a lot for a ticket to send his wife to, to, to see the, the, the hanging. Uh, uh, les tricoteurs during the French Revolution passed the uh, afternoons uh, looking at the guillotine. So, uh, and I, I repeat, uh, children, children love, uh, love uh, monsters. So there is certainly a penchant of our sensitivity that makes us excited by, by ugliness, provided it doesn't touch us. Because if we look in the mirror and we see us as very ugly, then we change our aesthetic opinions. But uh, yes, there is this, this not. Um, it, it is normal to, to, to appreciate certain form uh, of, of ugliness because it's linked to the experience of the comic. Comic, uh, again, you know, it's very difficult to define comic. Uh, uh, all the, the existing theories are uh, uh, unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory, but at least there is still something in all the definition of comic. It is the disgrace of something else we are not involved with. Huh? If I stumble, uh, uh, that's not comic. If you stumble, I, I, I laugh. Then there is the difference between if uh, the one who stumbles is an old lady or a general. A general is more comic uh, than an old lady because with the old lady there is a feeling of compassion. With the general we are very happy that he stumbled because he's not supposed to. Is not supposed to. And the ugly is more or less, the experience of the ugly is more or less linked to the experience of, of the comic. A disgrace that doesn't involve us and doesn't involve senses of compassion. If it is the old lady who stumbled, there is a compassion because that, you know. I, I don't know if I have uh, answered your, your question. Yeah, person. Hello, Matea Cheto. Uh, it's hard to not to compare ugliness here, over here, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I can also say I was very happy to hear your presentation, including the fact it was done with a beautiful Italian accent. Um, but uh, the point I have and the question I would put to you uh, it relates to the comparison with beauty, the antipode of ugliness. Um, and there is a sentiment because you concluded with the argument about law as well, that included the local, a legal story. Um, there is an argument put by many, including Elaine Scarry, that beauty promotes justice. And there are several reasons why it does so. One of them being that beauty is very much related to being good. And that beauty instigates in the observer of beauty the act of replication. Um, that, you know, when you see something beautiful, you want to replicate it. Like when uh, Dante saw Beatrice, he wrote sonnets about Beatrice. Then he found the sonnets beautiful, so he, he wrote explanations of the sonnets on Beatrice, uh, etc. And that the other reason it does so is because it decenters us. It enables us to see something else as the center of the universe, except our, our, rather than ourselves. And by doing that, it enables us to see beauty as a mode, as some sort of a vehicle for justice. That's the argument proposed. And I was wondering if at all you find some merit to this argument, would you say there is also something to be found about ugliness instigating, because this is all about, not so much about the object itself, but about the effect it has on the observer. So would you have some sort of opinion on whether or not ugliness may have beneficial um, effects on the observers and whether or not compassion, which you've said twice, should be one of the outcomes of our thoughts about all this, would be one of those results that the ugliness could have in promoting um, justice or anything of the sort as well. Thank you. This is not exactly a question, but a treatise uh, on beauty. <laughs> No, I, I don't understand the uh, relationship between uh, beauty and justice, if not in the old Greek sense that uh, there is an absolute identity with, uh, between the good and the, and the beautiful. 
and also according to uh, a very old uh, tradition which for many aspects still holds uh, that beauty is proportion and proportion is a, a notion that uh, holds also for, for justice, the right uh, balance in this sense, okay. But um, when you said that the beauty is uh, always reproductive, I, I think that we are, we risk always, you, me, everybody, uh, to make a confusion uh, between the real beauty and the, the represented beauty. The represented beauty is a case of the, the real ugliness and the represented ugliness. Uh, because um, the represented ugliness is an example of beauty, as we have seen with the Ghirlandaio. And so the, 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 the discourse changes radically. While the natural ugliness is well, something that uh, is repellent or interesting. In this sense, it can also excite a moral response. Not necessarily, but it can. The case of uh, Calvino at the end. But uh, it is something more. It has nothing to do with the aesthetic uh, the, uh, definition. Uh, ugliness can be repellent, but if I have a I am a saint, this uh, uh, excites in me uh, more feelings and the virtuous uh, response and like the Baroque saints, I lick the, the, the wounds of the, um, of the plague uh, people and so on and so forth. But as I know. And on the contrary, a, a very well represented ugliness has the same effect effect of a very well represented beauty. I mean, there is no difference between the representation of Beatrice and the representation of Lucifer in Dante. <laughs> they are both beautiful examples of <laughs> representation. Okay. Our time is over and that was a very nice thought. So I do believe that we have to finish for today and I would like to thank you very much for your presentation. It was nice, it was beautiful, it was enjoyable. Thank you very much indeed.